Hello, I'm John Loring, pastor of the Baptist Church in the Great Valley. You can find our website at baptistbcgv.org where there will be a listing of events and more information uh, about the church. On April the 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in, in Virginia. There were still some loose ends to be tied up, but the Civil War was rapidly drawn to an end. On the evening of April the 14th, John Wilkes Booth entered Ford's Theater and quietly made his way up to the presidential box where Abraham Lincoln and his wife and a couple of friends were watching the play. Finding the box unguarded, he pulled out his single shot 44 caliber Derringer and shot the president in the back of the head. He slashed with his knife as Major Rathbone uh, tried to grab him and then he vaulted over the railing and he dropped down to the stage below breaking a bone in his left leg in the fall. Then he uttered his lines, Si Semper Tyrannus, and struggled off stage, escaping to Maryland on his horse. We have also had a full measure of terrible crimes and, and, and tragedies in our own age, in our own time. And the first question that people often ask is, why did they do it? What drove them to do this thing? Well, motivations are complex. With John Booth, it seems likely that he was motivated by a desire to overcome a, a sense of inferiority that he seemed to drag with chains behind him everywhere he went. He was the illegitimate son of his father, a, a famous actor named Junius. He was the ninth of ten children. He showed some theatrical talent, but he was considered emotionally unstable. He was very egocentric and, and jealous of his brother Edwin, who was widely regarded as the better actor. Perhaps lacking the courage to meet an enemy face to face on a field of battle, he joined a secret Confederate group called the Knights of the Golden Circle. And with a group of conspirators, he tried and failed repeatedly to kidnap the president. It is reported that on the evening of the assassination, he went to a bar next to the theater, and there some acquaintances were razzing him and, and, and ribbing him about, about not being as famous as his brother Edwin, to which he replied, When I leave the stage, everyone in America will know my name. The crime was committed dramatically, as an actor would design it. He, he owned a multi-shot revolver, but, but chose a single-shot Derringer. He took his knife and fought with Major Rathbone with, with high, over-the-head swings that would have looked great on a stage, but uh, a, a forward thrust is going to be far more deadly far more difficult to defend against. Leaping down onto the stage was pure theatrics. And then he delivered the line he had memorized. How grand, how glorious it all must have seemed in his imagination as he was planning this, this heinous crime. Hidden by a sympathetic uh, Confederate agent for five days, in a Maryland swamp, he repeatedly requested newspapers, newspapers, like any actor. 
He wanted to know what the critics would say about his performance. Well, the critics didn't like it one little bit. There was no valor in shooting a man in the back. And the people of the South saw immediately that nothing good was going to come out of this. So what about Judas? What was his motivation for betraying Jesus? Unlike John Wilkes Booth, who left writings and diaries, a, a multitude of newspaper accounts and court documents from the trials of the conspirators, and all of which led to thousands of books being written about Lincoln's assassination, the information on Judas is, is very sparse. Down through the years, many possible motives have been suggested. Some say he acted from greed. Others say he was possessed by the devil. Some see him as a political revolutionary trying to start a war against the Romans. Some say he was just a, a stupid guy who was manipulated by the high priests. And others said, no, he was Jesus' best friend who did what had to be done in order for Jesus to fulfill his destiny. People fill in the blanks with their own imagination and the possibilities multiply. The first written portions of our New Testament were the letters of Paul. And Paul never even mentions Judas. Then the Gospels were written 30, 40, 50 years after the time of Jesus. The first is attributed to, to Mark, who wasn't even a disciple, and neither was Luke. And then we have Matthew and John, who were disciples, but the Gospels were probably scribed by others who used their memories and their teaching and, and their preaching. Uh, took the words of the original disciples and then edited and composed them and, and made them as we find them today. The hero, Judas Maccabeus, had liberated the country of Israel from Assyrian rule 150 years earlier. And Judas was still a, a popular name in New Testament times. Uh, the name Judas means a man from the tribe of Judah, or it could mean a Jew. The first century historian Josephus mentions some 15 different people named Judas in, in his works. In the New Testament, again, we find the name Judas many times, referring to many different people. It seems that Jesus had a brother named Judas, or the alternative form being Jude. Uh, two of the other disciples may have also had the name Judas, uh, sometimes carrying the careful notation by the Gospel writers that they were not the Judas. They were not Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. The Iscariot portion of the name probably indicates that he was from the village of Kerioth, located in Judah, making him the only disciple who was not from Galilee. I wonder if that could have caused a bit of tension within the group. I wonder if he ever felt like an outsider. Hmm. Early in his ministry, Jesus chose the twelve disciples. Other followers would come and go, but these twelve were selected for special training and attention and responsibility. We read in Matthew that Jesus sent them out across Israel to preach the good news. Preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out the demons. But don't go around passing the hat. 
You're not to be trying to acquire gold or silver or, or even copper to line your pockets. Freely you have received, so freely give. Well, if Judas had been primarily motivated by money, this should have tipped him off right off the bat that he was unlikely to grow wealthy in the service of God's kingdom. So how did Judas perform as a disciple? Well, it sounds like, along with the others, he got straight A's. The disciples came back from their preaching tour just stoked and excited, saying, we cast out demons, we anointed the sick with oil, and, and we healed them. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. He said, wow, good job, fellas. That's the way to go. Apparently, Judas started out fully committed and effective. So what changed? In Mark's Gospel, we, we read of an unnamed disciple who was upset by what he perceived to be an extravagant waste when the woman anointed Jesus with expensive ointment made from nard. Perhaps, perhaps this was the final straw for Judas in his journey away from Jesus. Uh, immediately after this event, we find him going to the high priest, offering to betray Jesus. In the Gospel of John, the writer actually names names, and we read that it was Judas who was upset by the anointing when the ointment could have been sold and the money given to the poor. But John goes on to, to clarify that Judas really didn't care about the poor, but, but, but Judas said it because he was a thief and he used to help himself to what had been put into the common purse. In Luke's Gospel, we read that Satan entered into Judas. Likewise, in John's Gospel, where the understanding is that Satan entered into him immediately after Jesus had dipped a piece of bread into the sauce and handed it to him as an honorific gesture at the Last Supper. The actual betrayal found in all four Gospels takes place when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Reading from Mark's Gospel, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the high priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him respectfully. And the men seized Jesus and arrested him. So why? Why did Judas do it? As mentioned, some of the disciples concluded that he did it for money, for the 30 pieces of silver that he was offered. But, you know, 30 pieces of silver really wasn't all that much money. It seems to me likely that there was more to it than just greed. The, the German poet Klopstock suggested that Judas had become jealous of the friendship that Jesus had with John, who eventually was given the title, The Beloved Disciple. Perhaps Judas wanted to be Jesus' right-hand man, his numero uno. Jealousy can drive people to do some pretty terrible things. One of the problems that Jesus faced repeatedly with his disciples was their ambition for earthly power and prestige. 
How often it seems they would be fussing with each other over who is greatest in the kingdom of God, who's going to be first in the kingdom, who's going to have thrones to the right and, and the left of Jesus. Jesus tried to dissuade them of this notion when he washed their feet at the Last Supper. Could this act of humility have pushed Judas over the edge, convincing him that this was not a movement that he wanted to be a part of? Another idea that we hear is that it was not Judas's intention that Jesus would die at all, but by having him arrested, it would force Jesus to act. It would force Jesus to use God's power in a mighty way to, to defeat his enemies and bring on the revolution against the Roman occupiers. Both Luke and John simply say, the devil entered into him. Now, I don't believe that the devil can force his way into a believer's heart or, or mind, but what happens is we sometimes leave the door unlocked or, or open just a little bit, or we, we begin to ruminate on, on other possibilities that might be more satisfying. And Satan can be such a, a flattering, satisfying guest that we decide to leave the door open again and again. Before long, Judas wanted Jesus to be what he wanted Jesus to be. He wanted uh, to work out the plans and the ambitions of his own heart. Rather than surrendering to God's will, he wanted Jesus to surrender to his will. They say that the essence of sin is pride. And the core of sin is independence. And the heart of sin is the desire to do whatever we want rather than what God would prefer. What motivated Judas to betray Jesus? Well, I, I really don't know. Perhaps it, it really doesn't matter. But what does matter is what we recognize that tempts us. What makes us conceal our allegiance to Jesus? What makes us kind of forget about our commitment to Jesus? Is it money? Is it the desire for power and to get our own way? Is it the desire to be popular with, with people we respect or like? Is it a desire for, for pleasure? Do we take our allegiance to Jesus into account when we turn on the TV and decide what we're going to watch for entertainment? Does it matter as we are with friends. The Apostle Paul encourages us to let our minds dwell on things that are true and honorable and just and pure and pleasing and commendable. Let us choose those things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Let us pray. Lord God, you know us through and through, and you know how easily we fail and how often we miss the mark. Please help us, Lord. Help us to be strong in our faith and help us to make the decisions that count, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.